Well, I'm quite proud to be here today. Uh, I am also very grateful to Rich for being a huge inspiration to me. And um, echoing what some people said, he really gave me a chance. And although Joe Graves did suggest that the grad committee take a look at my uh, sketchy uh, application, um, I was very clueless. I'm very impressed by the graduates who go into new programs now, just what they want to do with their career, and they have it kind of figured out ahead of time. And I only was interested in evolution. That's it. And, um, very naive about the future, I admit that. And Rich, you definitely helped me uh, learn a lot of lessons. So it was difficult thinking about what I should talk about today. And, uh, especially I have to hold some material back because presumably you're going to have like a retirement party. Maybe not. You didn't even blink your eyes. So uh, uh, I did hold back a little bit of material. but. Um, I do want to talk about some of the time that I spent in Rich's lab in the early 90s when I was in UC Irvine and some of the lessons that he taught me. So in these other pictures that you saw this morning were just kind of looking off, maybe thinking about other topics, but he might have been thinking about why did he take this person into his lab and for sure don't let him anywhere near the long-term line because I don't, I don't know if there's any other student who's never chanced for a job. <laughs> maybe it's not surprising. Uh, so at UC Irvine in 89, 91, around that time, uh, I guess we're on the fifth or seventh floor of engineering building, something like that. And that's where the, the baby LTPE is. But that's not really the picture of the babies on the right there, but they were infantile at the time that I came into the lab. And uh, the other players in the lab, John Mittler, who you heard about uh, this morning, he was a senior student studying microbiology. And then there was also Mike. Uh, <laughs> and nothing to add to that. <laughs> so, Sarita Bossi was also in the lab at that time. And you can see by my, my footwear that I was learning from Rich some of the academic <laughs> dress down. And um, the other person was Valeria. It was, I think she was the only postdoc in the lab at that time. But it was a great crew of people who were very supportive me, and uh, I learned as much from him as I did from Rich. Maybe not my crew, it's not what I would have been. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it was really a terrific crew of people. So my first thesis project, that I thought was just not my idea, was about the co-evolution of carrying birds in the Because I thought this must be, I was really into co-evolution, and Rich and I met money every day. I had all these ideas about co-evolution, I had no idea what should work with, and I think we can talk for 20 minutes, and you convinced me that uh, microbes were the way to go. So riffing on that, I still had this passion and care for charismatic megafauna, including vultures, which I thought, that's got to be hard making a living this way, eating rotting flesh. So I went into Rich's office and proposed this project to him, and I, I think the word is guffaw. He just uh, <laughs> lost it. He, <laughs> And when he stopped laughing and the coffee was not going out of his nose, he basically said, no, there's no way you're going to do that project. So uh, unfortunately, now we know that that's a little thing that we call the microbiome. It could have been uh, on the front lines of this. But I, I won't hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> it's circa 1990. Anyway, um, so he said, do you have any other ideas? And fortunately, it didn't take much convincing that there's just so much power even in bacteria and their genetic elements to use them as model systems. So uh, to get to a little bit of the science, at that time, Rich brought to my attention this great paper by Roman Lenski in 88. And uh, the fact that conjugate plasmids are these genetic elements that sort of feel their, only, their own forces of selection and that they will transfer both horizontally and vertically. You can think of them as great model systems for parasites that transmit through those neurons. And kind of at this time, um, you know, the HIV AIDS crisis was happening. We had a graduate student in the department who died of AIDS while I was there. So there was a uh, tremendous feeling of importance for parasite systems and what was happening in them. And uh, also around that time, May and Anderson and others were producing theory on evolution of virulence. 
that everybody was reading these papers and helping to uh, explain why ecology matters. And if most parasite interactions, and you won't have parasites inevitably evolving to be mutualists. That was a very popular idea around that time. But that there are forces in the environment, and the ecology matters, that will dictate the evolution of variance levels. And I won't go into the well-known example of the solar virus that was attempted to be used as a biocontrol agent in Australia. It did not work as well in the field as it did in the lab. It sort of set up a uh, evolved virulence level that was much less than useful. Uh, one of my favorite academic books was this, um, this, this book that was an edited volume, uh, but there was a chapter in it by Bruce Levin and Rich Linsky, Coalition of Bacteria and Their Viruses and Plasmids. And that was just more fodder for me to think about the power of using microbial systems to address a lot of the questions that were jazzing me at the time. So um, the overarching thing I want to say is that if you have parasites, where here in this example, if you consider horizontal transmission alone, vertical transmission alone, or the net effect across host density as an ecological variable, then um, the more virulent parasite B, the one is the, that is able to infect more host per unit time, will gain an advantage of that at high density. But if you just consider transmission across generations and the fact that virulent parasites can cause a greater uh, fitness deficit in their hosts, then you would expect that that wouldn't be uh, controlled by host density, but that less virulent parasites A would be favored over the more virulent ones B. And when you take it together, what I'm trying to say is that there are environmental conditions at which you would think that virulence can go up or there are other conditions where it will go down. So Rich and I uh, did an experiment on this in bacterial plasmids. And underlying, see all, all this trade-off theory was important to what May and Anderson were talking about and others were talking about. But a lot of the underlying assumption about whether these modes of transfer would trade off of each other actually, as far as I know, had not been demonstrated. And in our paper from uh, 98 with Vaughn Cooper. What you're seeing here is on the y-axis, that's essentially the rate of horizontal transmission. And on the x-axis is the degree of uh, fitness burden to the bacteria caused by these plasmids. And essentially, they're going in two different directions. If they go down one path and they become more virulent, they can't have their cake and eat it too. They're going to be a greater burden on their hosts. So that was really, that was really cool and satisfying, except that uh, before our paper was published, I was scooped in the sense that Jim Bull is just a terrific scientist. He and his colleagues had a very similar paper that uh, is very well cited, but it's really so. But I was detected of this. I was uh, really feeling happy about a project that was working, and yet at the same time, we found out that I was scooped. So this led me to a couple of lessons. One is that I got this from Rich that you have to be realistic and practical about your choice of study system, and I try and tell my own students that, that you might want to study carrion birds and uh, their gut flora. And maybe under some circumstances you could do that, but in the engineering building at UCI, uh, I think Rich knew that we shouldn't be bringing rotting in the <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give him that one. Uh, and big ideas should be pursued, but you can't be overly dismayed if other people pursue them and they find those discoveries first. This is the way science works. In the same way as I remember learning from you that you know ultimately a lot of our ideas, well just maybe mine, I don't know yours, will eventually be overturned in the history of science because this is the way the process works and the way the field works. And you have to be happy each day with the fact that ultimately a lot of your discoveries might uh, be overturned. So anyway, I, I learned those lessons from you. Uh, another thesis project that I proposed was testing ecological coexistence between E. coli genotypes. And these are a couple of graphs from uh, Bruce's paper in 1972 that was talked about this morning, where on the left, if you have this demographic trade-off where one genotype is advantaged under low resource condition and then it switches later on that the other genotype is advantaged under other conditions, then essentially you'd expect them to go to an equilibrium if you start from any initial frequency. Show on the right. So uh, with Valeria Salsa, uh, this is the only long-term experimental evolution paper that I'm on. I can believe you know that I didn't do any transfers in the lab. I'm not bitter about it or anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you, you offer for Zach to the first right now. There's still time. I can come by tomorrow. Zach will be six and I'll be six. <laughs> so uh, 
<laughs> what I'm trying to get at is in Rich's experiment, we took some of the strains at a certain time period, I guess it was Generation 7000, and we put into them more genetic variation through recombination rather than just spontaneous mutation. You turned off the TV. <laughs> yes, that's right. You turned off the TV, which for me is hard. Uh, uh, the dynamics that we saw, and actually this is not the population that we keyed on for another paper that we talked about in a moment, but at, sometimes you would see that there would be two genotypes coming out of that offshoot experiment that they would coexist through time. Clearly, the dynamic of time showed that. And it allowed me to go back and do similar experiments to what um, Bruce had done in that 72 paper. So, similarly, here we have a lac plus and a lac minus genotype because this was a marker that came in through the um, experiment itself. But the point is that they are going to an internal equilibrium. But uh, in this graph, there's a sort of a left side and a right side to that. And that's because the experiment was put on hold for me to go to uh, the first big conference that I ever attended. And it was in lovely Hilo, Hawaii. And with beautiful locations like this at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, one might not attend all of the conferences, <laughs> especially if your then girlfriend, future wife was with you at the time, backpacking around Hawaii. So uh, that was a great time, but it led to this asterisk in the uh, graph. Amazingly, <laughs> 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 even the people in my own group tell me about this. Oh, yeah, that was the time you went to Hawaii. Really good. <laughs> uh, so anyway, now we know that glycerol, through frozen storage, that you can start up these uh, interacting genotypes from the freezer, and one of them will gain an advantage. But when that cholesterol disappears, they'll go back to an equilibrium. So I'd say we've learned something from this. <laughs> um, but that, that explains the asterisk in the graph. And I am fiercely supportive of my students going to, going to uh, science conferences. I think it's great for networking. It's a great way to give your first talk, give your first poster. Um, it just so happened I brought a poster with me to Hawaii. Uh, there was a blackout at the poster session, so I didn't even get a chance to talk about my poster. <laughs> but everybody ate a lot of sushi because the air conditioning failed and we really wanted to eat it before it went bad. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I do really support students attending science conferences, but maybe I should insist on a detailed summary of what they saw at the conference and the proceedings. Otherwise, they're going to repeat what I've done in the past. So thanks, Rich. Um, you were superb at creating a great environment in the laboratory, researchers who were passionate about what they did, just the same as you, and uh, you're also just a great example of how to balance life and work. And, um, very yeah, much I'm a disagree. <laughs> well, yeah, on her birthday, I'll tell a different story. Yeah. Uh, but uh, also, Mary Beth thanks you. She was a, she's not here today, but uh, I do appreciate you figuring out how miserable I was at times in this Lansing, and then I should go back to the Irvine um, more than occasionally and just work with Al Bennett. I was very fortunate to have you be supportive of that. And um, leaving people like me and Mike in charge of the lab when we went off to Oxford when we first moved to Michigan State, and Mike discovering that you can use a gas jet in the lab to function like a uh, blowtorch. <laughs> Even destroy a blacktop lab bench that was apparently keep resistant, but it's bigger than <laughs> <laughs> No, no, he did say that you had to die. <laughs>